When you walk into the Playhouse Bar, you immediately turn left or right. To the left, the piano bar. To the right, the dance bar. At 18 years old, I am terrified to be alone in gay bars, dance bars especially, so I tend to hang by the piano bar where it might be easier for someone to talk to me. A few do, but most of the piano guys are like three times my age. Don't get me wrong, I'm into older guys, but that means like 28. These guys are wearing shirts older than me. Hey, you gonna, you gonna hold that glass of ice all night or can I buy you a drink? I turn to see which one of the old timers is offering me a refreshment and I see him. Definitely Italian, well built, about 28 and handsome, like way out of my league, kind of handsome. But he's clearly talking to this kid who is staring at him, speechless. A drink, he repeats. What was in your glass? Oh, uh, a, a screwdriver. John Abellino flashes the kind of perfect smile that unfairly men that good looking are usually also blessed with. Because life just isn't fair. It, if it was, he should have a four-inch dick to offset those looks, but you know he's gonna be packing nine. In my league or not, I am instantly hooked. Beyond gazing into those deep green eyes, I find that I like his easy manner right away. He's friendly, funny, bright. We laugh a bunch and time flies by too fast. You bored? He's caught me looking at my watch. I, I explained that the last bus back to the dorms is at 2 a.m. and it's past 1.30. Oh, well, I'll give you a lift back to the dorms after breakfast tomorrow. I, I've only ever once gone home with someone I just met, but isn't that the whole point of being in a gay bar in 1983? <laughs> I find myself nodding yes before finding any words. I, I can't believe I'm gonna get to see him with his shirt off, let alone have sex with him. Minutes later, we are cruising down Lark Street, Albany's tiny little version of Hillcrest. I lean over to inhale him, a blend of natural scent and English leather aftershave. We walk down the brownstone stairs to his cute little basement apartment and then into his bedroom. I find it a little odd that one has to go through the bedroom we're in to get to the rest of the apartment, but then he kisses me and any thoughts of architectural design go right out of my mind. <laughs> we roll about on the bed kissing as he pulls off of my clothes with an eagerness I had not expected. In moments, I am wearing nothing but my Twistaflex wristband and my college ring. I put them on the nightstand, partly to keep lube off them and partly, to f and partly to feel completely naked as I leap onto my luscious playmate, <laughs> nudely empowered to strip him of the last barrier of, to me, the briefs that he is barely inside of, and for the record, closer to seven, but really thick. From From there, more kissing, nipple play, mutual sucking, stroking, grinding, the gay basics. <laughs> then, in a move that my first boyfriend always liked, I reach under his balls and between his legs and my middle finger finds his butthole for about half a second. He leaps off the bed like my finger had been a blowtorch. What the fuck? What the fucking fuck, man? What is it with you fucking gays that you're all about assholes all of the time? God fucking damn it! I, I'm stunned. I've, I've only been with a couple of guys, but so far, that move has had 100% positive reviews. <laughs> But, but this beautiful, buck-naked man clearly does not like being touched there. I'm confused and embarrassed, trying to apologize as his anti-butt tirade continues <laughs> while he's 
tearing furiously through his dresser, looking for whatever one suddenly seeks in response to having their anus unwantedly touched. <laughs> he finds it and splays it out on the bed between us. It's an issue of Hustler magazine. Hustler. The absolute antithesis of hot gay male sex. He starts thumbing through it intensely, caressing the pages as if they were the women themselves. He starts ranting about how hot they are, asking me which ones I find hot. I gesture at a brunette on one of the pages. She's pretty. I'm, I'm technically still calling myself bisexual at this point, so it's, it's not a stretch to see that she's attractive. I make an effort to join him in his desperate plunge for lust for the female body, which, which probably would have been easier for me if this actual smoking hot, naked, well-hung man weren't four inches away from me. <laughs> but something about the magazine and the sight of the naked women and my showing interest in them too begins to settle him. He relaxes. His hand finds my shoulder, my back, my ass, but just the cheek. <laughs> we start to kiss again, and in my confused, naive attraction for this guy, I somehow think things are okay again. He goes down on me, but frequently glancing at the magazine. Eventually, he gets me off and then gets himself off, looking back and forth between me and a blonde in stilettos. The magazine gets put away, we go under the covers, I cuddle into his band roll scented armpit, <laughs> and, and we fall into a peaceful sleep together as if this wasn't the most fucked up thing ever. <laughs> Somewhere around 4 a.m., I'm awakened by an argument about 10 feet away in the living room. I place John's voice in the commotion. It's muffly, but I can tell that the other guy is really upset that I'm in the bed. Then, in the pitch blackness, that other man comes through the bedroom I'm in, delays there momentarily, and then goes out that second door down the hallway where he slams what I presume is the door to another bedroom. John comes back in and apologizes. Oh, was that your boyfriend? No, no, my roommate, Louis, but he gets jealous. Sorry, just, just go back to sleep. So, so I do. Hours later, I awaken, and thank goodness, Louis is gone. John offers to take me out for that breakfast, and I accept. As John showers, I dress in last night's clothes, which reek of bar smoke. Once dressed, I turn to the nightstand and see my ring, just my ring, no watch. And for the ring to have been there, the watch would have had to have been lifted straight up. I look on the floor around the bed, no watch. John comes out, and he searches too, but no sign of it. I, I, I can't believe this, he says, but I get that the only answer is that Lewis took it. I'll search through his stuff later, and I'll call you if I can find it. I, I'm so sorry about this. During an awkward breakfast and lift back to the dorms, I'm thinking about my dad. How am I going to explain to my dad that his watch is gone? The one he bought on his honeymoon? The one he made a big deal of letting me wear as he sent me off to college? I explained this to John. I, I totally understand, but here's my number. We'll find it, I'm sure. Over the next week, I hear nothing from John. I call like five times a day, and it just rings without an answer. I finally decide I'm going to take the bus down there. I walk the five blocks from the bus stop to his apartment door, and I ring the bell. No answer. I stare at the doorknob, and I try it. It turns. I push. The door opens. I yell, hello, <laughs> no reply. And with the great wisdom of an 18-year-old, I enter the apartment and close the door behind me. I pass, because <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> I pass 
I'm not looking. I pass through the living room, enter John's bedroom, and go down that hall. Lewis's door is slightly open, and I slip inside. It's mostly empty. In fact, the whole of apartment seems emptier than I remember it, like they're moving out. But I look down, and there's a yellow backpack leaning against Lewis's closet. He stole my dad's watch. I get to look in his backpack in, in his room in the apartment I just broke into. <laughs> Books, Marlboros, Jujubes, but no watch. I look up at the closet and think, oh, what the hell? I slide the closet door open and there's nothing in there but a jean jacket. I reach into the jean pocket, jacket pocket, and hear the front door slam. There's only one place I can go. I take a breath and step into the closet and slide the door shut behind me from the inside. There's basically no light. I can hear myself sweating. My heart is beating so loudly that I'm afraid it'll give me away. But over that pounding, I do hear someone moving around. Minutes pass as I fear that whoever it is will come in and suddenly want that jacket. If it's Lewis, he wouldn't recognize me. But if it's John, even if somehow I get past him, fuck, he knows my name, my phone number, and which dorm I'm in. I'm just going to have to use the element of surprise. <laughs> An insane sweep through the whole apartment with my head down. Whoever it is will be so stunned that I can get to the front door and keep running if it's unlocked. I really, really hate this plan. But I've just committed breaking and entering so good plans are a luxury. Then I hear an odd squeak and another sound, running water. Whoever it is turned on the shower, give him a minute. One, two, three, this is not happening. 20, 21, 22, I really don't want to get arrested. 34, 35, 36, I never even got detention in high school. 46, 47, 48, I cannot believe I am literally back in the closet. <laughs> 58, 59, 60. I gingerly slide the door open just a little and then dash down the hall as fast as I can, finding no one, praise God, in the living room as I throw open the mercifully unlocked front door, leap up the basement steps, and run all the way up Lark Street, never looking back. I received no calls from John that week. So a week later... <laughs> I return to their place. No answer to the bell. The door is locked this time. A man comes down from the upstairs brownstone. You looking for the guys who lived in there? Oh, yes, uh, one of them is a friend of mine. He informs me that there had been about eight guys living in there in shifts. They never paid him again after the deposit and it took months to evict the whole lot of them. Suddenly I got that John was as likely the thief as Lewis, and I catch the irony of the name Hustler. <laughs> A month later, I'm out at the Playhouse Bar and I see John. It's a weird moment when you run into the semi-homeless stud, stud who sucked your dick, stole your watch, and then treated you to pancakes. I asked him about the watch because how could I not? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I looked through his stuff and I didn't find it. Sorry about that. Another awkward pause, and then he went off to the dance side. About eight months later, I shared the tale with a couple at the piano. Oh, <laughs> we know who you mean, the, the hottie with the Italian horn necklace. We don't see many of like him on the piano side. <laughs> you know you got off lucky, right? Lucky? He stole my watch. How did I get off lucky? 
Honey, he's in jail now for attempted manslaughter. What? Yep, John, or whatever he called himself to you that night, he hooked up with some guy, robbed him, and locked the poor fella in the trunk of his own car. No water and the heat at that time. It was days before someone finally heard him. That flipped a switch in me. It made me realize that I had no idea who anyone in a bar was or what their motivation could be. Yeah. <laughs> In, in, in my case, since I was a poor college student with nothing more than a pretty watch, the straightish thug let me off cheaply, though I realize now it could have been brutal when things got too gay for what he was willing to do for cash. I made a rule that night that I kept for many years. I decided I would never sleep with any guy I met on the day I met him. If he didn't like me enough to call or to take my call to see him again, then maybe it was better that I didn't get laid that night. Now, compared to most 18-year-olds going to bars in New York, then that made me practically a nun. <laughs> but it was 1983, and since safe sex wasn't really a thing in Albany until around mid-85, that choice might have saved my life. To this day, I'm not always the most trusting person, and John probably lurks in the back of my subconscious, chanting the mantra, people aren't always all what they seem, because some really aren't. As for John himself, if he's alive, and he really might be, he'd only be about 66 now, I hope he is out there somewhere living safely and comfortably in an orange jumpsuit, <laughs> fooling no one, and protecting his precious asshole. Milo Shapiro, everybody!